Our manufacturing facility is flexible, it's responsive. We have all of the support and accreditations that you'd expect um, for a world-class manufacturer. We have, as I mentioned, we have our, our in-house uh, in design team. Um, this means we have a CAD studio, which means we can translate many of the hand-drawn um, designs that we have into uh, wall coverings. And with a, with a uh, really experienced design team, we can take a photograph and turn that into a wall covering. And that really is going to be the future of wall coverings now. Digital printing is going to be the, the new thing. But it gives you so much sophistication and variety that you can uh, pretty much have anything, any, kind, ren any rendition of any kind of picture on a wall. Our business um, is very sensitive to the environment. We have um, an ISO 14001 accreditation, which means that we are um, managing our operations in a way that make sure we're not polluting the local environment and that we choose the correct materials for manufacturing. And we basically set ourselves objectives and targets to maintain a good record. We have a suite of information, which I'll go on to later on, which gives you the kind of support that you need with your clients. Underlying all this, we have basically a, a team of incredibly enthusiastic and experienced individuals. Um, many of the people within the business have worked for, for us for over 30 years. Um, I've worked uh, with Neurospec for 38 years, so I sort of grew up there, if you like. Um, we're 160 people in the UK. Um, we have uh, businesses in Poland, France, Belgium, and Dubai. And in total, we employ about 200 people around the world. And just also, despite the fact this presentation is mainly about commercial wall coverings, um, we have the Fardis brand, which is more of a retail brand. And we also have a long history within retail products as well. Before you proceed, let me just make an overview. Χωρίς να θέλω να σας κουράσω, απλά να επισημάνω κάποια βασικά σημεία που χωρίς να ξέρω ακριβώς τι έχετε ε, επισημάνει και εσείς. Ε, η εταιρεία έχει τρεις διαφορετικούς τομείς. Έχει τις επαγγελματικές ταπετσαρίες, έχει τις ταπετσαρίες για το σπίτι και όλες χωρίζονται σε διαφορετικές ποιότητες. Υπάρχουν οι φασμάτινες ταπετσαρίες, υπάρχουν βινιλικές, υπάρχουν χάρτινες. Γενικά, η δύναμη της εταιρείας είναι ότι είναι μια κάθετη μονάδα, παρόλο που έχει διαφορετικές, διαφορετικά εργοστάσεις σε διαφορετικές χώρες. Και αυτό που μπορεί να επιτύχει είναι ότι μπορεί να κάνει το οποιοδήποτε σχέδιο μέσα από το στούντιό της να το εφαρμόσει σε οποιοδήποτε μορφή θέλει ο πελάτης. Είτε αυτό εδώ παίρνει μια αποτύπωση ενός παλιού υφάσματος σε μια υφασμάτινη τα πετσαρία, ή η αποτύπωση ενό υφασμάτινη τα πετσαρία σε μια βινηλική για το δυνατότητε τη επαγγελματική εφαρμογή. Ε, Σκιαγράφησε γενικά όλα τα διαφορετικά στοιχεία που υπάρχει στην εταιρεία Μιουρασπεκ και συγκεκριμένα ε, ο τρόπος με τον οποίο χωρίζονται οι κατηγορίες. Αλλά το πιο βασικό αυτό που θέλω να κρατήσετε είναι ότι είναι μια τρομερά ευέλικτη εταιρεία παρόλο το πολύ μεγάλο τους μέγεθος. Please proceed. Okay. Sorry for that. Yeah. Can I just check? If I talk like this, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Here is where we should start to get really interesting about product, how product is made. Um, oh, sorry, can I have one? Thank you. That's much better. You can move.
Okay, does everyone have uh, a packet there? Excellent. Okay, so um, what you have there is some samples of some products that are manufactured at our, at our facility in East Peckham. Okay, so you have a sample of a wall covering that um, has a woven fabric on it, a non-woven fabric, and paper. And these are good examples of, of normal commercial wall coverings, contract wall coverings. They are different kind of specifications, but the one thing to say when you're dealing with a, a contract wall covering is you're dealing with a product that's going to last a long time. Typically, it's going to last 10, 20, 15, or 20 years. So whichever one you go for, it's going to be a long-lasting type of product. And that's because we formulate and we manufacture in a way to make sure that the product will be very, very durable. But these are fundamentally the three main types of wall covering. Actually, whether it's a textile wall covering or a vinyl wall covering, generally they'll be on a backing of some sort, so a fabric, a non-woven, or a paper. So that's what they all have in common. I'm mainly just talking today about um, vinyl wall coverings, um, mainly because that's uh, what we make, and they are the most durable and uh, good value products. In your pack, you've got a, a product which is like a, a kind of beige product with a, a fairly stable woven product on the back. And this backing is called Osnaberg. It's a type of woven fabric. Um, it's um, made from polyester and cotton, and it's usually used, if you, if you go to buy something called a, a type 2 wall covering, which if when you're talking to people who uh, are, are manufacturing and selling or are familiar with the wall covering market, type 2 is a type of product that is very, very commonly talked about. And it's characterized by this type of fabric on the back. So this is a specific type of weave. It's thought to have been named after the city of Osnabrück in Germany, and I, I can't really say whether that's true or not because I don't think I was around at the time. But um, it's, it's tough, it's heavy, and it's what allows the product to be very, very durable. I mentioned this Type 2 uh, specification. Type 2 is, a, is a, a description of a product that comes from America. It's typically, it comes from the American federal specification. And, and you probably know that if you end up supplying anything to the military in a company, in, in a country, you will have, they will provide you with a specification. And that's where this comes from, because during the uh, 50s and 60s in America, um, wall covering manufacturers wanted to supply um, American naval bases and army bases with wall coverings for their wall. So the federal government said, well, we've got to have a specification for this. So ding, there it is, type two. And there's another one, type one as well, um, which just really says what the performance is like. And type two is pretty much the highest level. So for a commercial wall covering, if you're looking at buying a type two product, it's going to last you for ages. It's the toughest you can get nearly, and uh, it, for practical reasons. Um, and uh, that's if you like one of the major types of products that you can buy. Having said that, there are other types of fabric-backed wall coverings. If you look in your pack, you will find another sample with a sort of another fabric or another woven fabric, but it feels, if you get it out, it feels quite flimsy, and if you move it around, its weave isn't quite as stable as the Osnaberg. Technically, this is called scrim. It's lighter weight than the Osnaberg fabric, um, and it's used normally to make uh, fabric back wall coverings that are, that are not of a type two. So it's not, not the highest uh, product specification compared to the American federal spec, but you'll see a lot of wall coverings on the market uh, like this, um, around about 350 grams per square meter, um, but again, very, very durable because of the fabric backing.
Then there is another type of fabric um, called a non-woven. Now, in your packs, let me just, sorry, my pack doesn't seem to, can I, can I just borrow somebody's? Uh, thank you. It's okay. So you'll find in the pack, you've got this lovely snakeskin effect, kind of brown snakeskin. And on the back of that is a sample of a fabric. This is a non-woven fabric. Now, some people say this looks a bit like paper, but it isn't. It's something completely different because it's made from a mixture of um, polyester and uh, cellulose. And the reason it's called a fabric is because the term non-woven came from the textile industry originally. So when the textile industry were making fabrics that were not knitted or were not woven, they had to find a phrase to describe the type of fabric. And so they, you know, if, for example, felts, because felts are neither woven nor um, knitted. So they come up with, came up with the term non-woven. So that's how it is that um, non-woven back products are, are, are called textile, um, sorry, fabric wall coverings. Um, the thing about non-wovens is that they, they vary a lot in specification. So the one you've got on the back is here is really tough. If you try and tear this, it's actually it's quite a difficult job. And this non-woven has been made to make a, a type 2 product. So what I mentioned before, you can have these products that are really tough that meet the federal specification, type 2. You can do it with either a woven fabric or, in some cases, if you use the right specification of non-woven, you can achieve the performance in this way. So, you can see non-wovens that look like paper. They may actually behave like paper because you can change the specification of these and you can, um, if you vary the fiber length of the polyester in here, or you vary the amount of polyester that's in the backing, you can go from a really, really tough backing to something that actually is quite flimsy and weak. And you can, you can tell the difference between a contract wall covering and a retail wall covering um, very much by the way, by the specification of the non-woven on the back. So a very, very cheap non-woven may have very short fiber lengths and it may have uh, much less polyester than a, a, a true commercial wall covering, which will have long fiber lengths and a higher level of polyester. Um, the, the fiber length makes a difference because when you, the, in the manufacturing process, um, as you lay the fibers down and mingle them together, the longer they are, the more entangled they get, and that means they, it gives more strength to the non-woven. Just lastly on the constructions, paper-backed wall coverings. I said at the start, don't think that because paper isn't as strong as non-woven or fabric, it means that um, contract wall coverings made from paper are, are not tough. But it has to be said, this is the sort of value end of the range. So whilst these still will last for a long, long time and as tough as old boots, they're nevertheless don't achieve the same sort of specification as, uh, as, as a woven fabric or a high quality non-woven. Um, we always, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're quite considerate to um, the environment and we're making sure that uh, when we buy paper, we make sure it's FSC or PEFC certified um, so we know where the woods come from and uh, uh, we know that the forests that the wood comes from is uh, managed responsibly. responsibly. So just to summarize then, the main product types are type two woven fabric backed products, type two non-woven fabric backed, so if you like, tip top of the range, uh, fabric back and non-woven, uh, 
fabric backed and non-woven backed wool coverings um, at around about 350 GSM and paper backed wool coverings at around 270. And I, I know I neglected to say something about weight, but you can just see here a sort of kind of general uh, summary of the performance of wool coverings. So you can see when people make uh, paperback products, they tend to, this is manufacturers in general, I mean, I'm, you know, there are differences, but this is the general situation. Um, paperback vinyls tend to be around about 270 grams per square meter. F traditional fabric back products are around about 350 grams per square meter. And then when you get up to the, uh, the higher quality products that I've been talking about, um, the 400, type, type two fabric back vinyls, um, they tend to be around about 455 GSM. And you can see that uh, at 270 GSM paper backed, you know, overall level of durability that you're getting is around good. And then we're moving up to excellent in the type two region. And then, I mean, it has to be said there are, technically there is a type three and that's just off the scale, but then it'd be off the scale for cost as well. Okay. So those are the main product constructions um, that we manufacture. Now these performance symbols indicate different characteristics that a commercial wall covering may have. Um, we'll start with the most important one, which is in relation to fire rating. Because commercial, build, uh, commercial wall coverings are used in buildings where there are, uh, accumulate, there are a lot of people in the building, like in a hotel um, or in, in an office block, commercial wall coverings have to meet the highest performance levels for fire. So we have to know that if a fire breaks out in a, in a building, the wall coverings are not going to be um, adding to the problem. So. In Europe, there's a, 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 a harmonized test method, um, which uh, is a way of testing product that actually simulates the effects of a small uh, fire breaking out in a, in a waste paper basket in the corner of a room. It's called the single burning item test. And if you want to place a wall covering on the market in Europe, you have to know the performance of your wall covering according to that test. And the result from the test goes from a class D to a class B. And what you can use in your building is determined by your local country building regulations. So usually in Europe, you'll find that for commercial buildings, uh, hospitals, uh, com uh, communal areas in flats, the requirement is that you have a class B fire performance. And that's very important because if you install wall coverings in a building and you don't have a fire rating or you put the, the product in that's got the wrong fire rating, um, A, it's a, it's, a, it's a danger to the people living in the building if they have a fire, but also you might have to take it all off the wall again if the local building inspectors find out what you've done. So a very important area of, of compliance and uh, very important to check what you're putting on the wall matches the building regulations. The next area of performance that's important to consider is also whether or not, when you install a wall covering, is it going to, is it going to give off anything into the room? Is it going to make your room smelly? Or is it going to re release anything that you should be worried about? And in Europe, Typically, what people use is a system that was developed by the French government for measuring building and construction products that rates the emissions of uh, what they call volatile organic compounds, materials that, and to use a term which is, I often hear is materials that off-gas. If you, you can get a performance from C to A+. Plus. And what we find is that um, our wall coverings typically achieve an A+. Plus. Uh, performance rating. 
Could you um, click on that, please? And just to, just to show you what this looks like, if you wouldn't mind scrolling down a bit. Is that OK? OK, yeah. So, so we have all of our wall coverings measured according to this French scale. And what we're looking at is, uh, is, is various different chemicals. And we're trying to make sure and reassure ourselves, because we pretty much know that they're all going to be A+. Plus. But we have to measure it, and we have to demonstrate to clients that this is actually the case. And these are the types of things we measure for. We can give these certificates, and uh, all of our partners will have copies of our certification. So um, we can always prove what we say. Can we go back, please? OK. Um, <clears throat> According to? Raoul. Sorry. Sorry. Briam. OK. Yes. Yes, they do. So the question was, do our wall coverings have certification to the Briam system? And the, the Briam system is, is based on the building research establishment in the UK. And the, the building research establishment have set up a a series of standards for office refurbishments um, within which it has requirements that you have to comply with. And um, in fact, uh, those, those I won't go into what those are, but the answer to your question is, yes, they do. And I'll be showing a, 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 some information later that, that validates that. Um, the next thing that you might like to consider about the wall coverings you're buying is whether or not they contain a biocide. Depending on where you are in the world, you may have uh, very high humidities and hi very high temperatures. And this can be quite a challenging environment to any kind of wall covering. Um, there are ways of counteracting that. And um, the main way is to put a biocide in the product. What it basically does is it, it protects the product from molds and fungus and um, stops those, those little bits of mold eating your eating your wall covering. Um, I think we've got something to show what happens when that goes wrong, could I? OK, so this is, this is a, an example of the test that you can do to verify whether or not your wall covering has protection. The top layer is uh, the one where um, we have the biocide in, where we have uh, no mold growth. And then we have some examples of when things go wrong. And uh, there's no biocide in the product, and you can see that um, it's quite easy to get mold growth. And this is a standard test. Again, we have certificates to support, uh, the, support it. So when we say there's a biocide in the product, we can say that it meets a particular performance standard, which in fact is uh, it's an American test method called ASTM G21 for you know, technical folk amongst you. Um, OK, can we go back, please? Um, just as the next, the next uh, consideration is light fastness. I, I, I don't know if um, many of you had this experience where um, with a fabric in the sunlight, it's changed color where the fabric, uh, where the sunlight hits the fabric. And, uh, you know, that's something can also happen with wall coverings. Um, there is a test method that you can use to um, establish how good the uh, material is and how, how, well, how resistant it is to sunlight. Um, and that scale is from one to eight. Um, and um, there's, uh, on that one to eight scale, it actually relies, the test relies on the um, tendency of fabrics to change color um, as a method of being able to test other materials. So if we could have that click on the light fastness, please. Is there anyone left? Sorry. <laughs> Just on the, on the little sunlight symbol, please. Okay, it's a... Uh... Click on that one. Okay, yeah. So, so what you see here is um, these are some, there's some samples of wall coverings. So these, 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 and these. 
They're samples of wool covering. These are bits of um, wool that have been impregnated with dyes that have, uh, the dyes have got a specified level of resistance to sunlight. So that when you put this, when this test starts, there isn't a line across here. This is where a piece of cardboard sits. And this whole test piece goes under, under an artificial sun, under a UV light. And so where, so, so where the piece of cardboard is here, this is the, the original blue color. And underneath is the effect of the exposure to the UV. So you can see that, in fact, um, the wall coverings haven't changed color, but the fabrics have. And this is our way of testing whether, whether or not the wall covering um, has a, a resistance to light in, in practice compared to standard textile tests. So on this scale, uh, we're pretty much getting a, a level six uh, performance. Um, for, a, for, a fa for a really light, fast fabric, you'd be getting a, a level four result. So, and, and, and each step up is like an exponential improvement. It's not a linear one, it's kind of like a, a curve. So a level six is a really very good performance. So that's how we test for light fastness. Um, can we have the next, please? Um, also, just to, there's a little symbol there which shows, shows an alpha and omega co coefficient of acoustic performance. Basically, if you, it's not very good in offices for, their, for them to be very echoey and, and just, and generally people these days want to have soft environments in which they work and live. They don't like being in a, a in rattling around in a tin kind of effect. So. Um, it is possible to make wall coverings that will reduce the reverberation time within a room. So, of course, the scientists have come up with a means of measuring this, and it's, it's called the acoustic coefficient. And you can get wall coverings that run from an alpha omega figure of about 0.15 up to about 0.5. Um, our normal commercial wall coverings, they have an effect. It's 0.15, it means they, they on scoring schemes for measuring acoustic performance, we have a, a, an acknowledged effect on the room. It may not be massive, but it's there and it helps bring, when you're putting together a scheme in a room that involves other materials to have an acoustic deadening effect, the wall coverings that you choose can make a difference as well. So it's just worth bearing that in mind. Then the next symbol, marine rating, this is something that is actually quite rare for wall covering manufacturers. So when you're looking around, you might find one or two, but it's not that common. And this is because uh, when you supply materials onto a, a boat, it's, a, it's a, from a fire point of view, being on a boat is a much more dangerous environment than being in a hotel or a, an office block because if the fire breaks out and the fire alarm goes off, it's a hell of a lot more difficult to get off a boat than it is to get out of a building. So the International Marine Organization have come up with a, a, a set of methods by which any materials that go onto a ship have got to meet certain safety requirements. And those are all to do with an enhanced level of fire safety. And it's not just about getting your product formulations right, you also have to jump through well, you have to go through a very rigorous certification process, which involves also um, IMO inspectors coming to your factory to look at how you manufacture products so that they know that on day one, if you supply a sample that passes the IMO test, when it comes to two years later or a year later, they'll come and check that you're making products the same way so that you're not just cheating the system. So it's a very, very rigorous means of making sure that you can get product that's safe, safe for use on, on, on ships. And as I said, not many companies have that. Um, the next um, requirement, actually this is a requirement for all wall coverings and one which anyone in the wall covering industry or involved in wall coverings should be aware of, is that if you're placing products on the European market, Wall coverings are classified as construction products, and that means legally they have to be CE marked. And that's for safety from the point of view of meeting 
the minimum fire requ requirements, meeting the minimum requirements for chemical content, um, and again, making sure that the manufacturing plant is, when, when you have your tests done, you can show that you maintain your product certification. The last thing I just want to cover is a cleanability. I mean, it's quite important if you have, if you want product to last for a long time, that you can maintain it. And uh, there are different levels that uh, wool covering manufacturers and the industry have determined, which give you um, different levels of cleanability. You can imagine, so for example, with textile wool coverings, sometimes all you can do is just is vacuum them down. But with uh, vinyl wool coverings, you can be a bit more aggressive about that. And if we could just run this video, I'll just show you a test that we do, which um, our, our products are, are what are called um, scrubbable, and you'll see why they're called scrubbable from the test. Could we run the video, please? That's one, thank you. Okay, so that's a brush. So this is uh, grit in water, and that's soap solution. And this weighs about 300 grams, and that head goes backwards and forwards 300 times. And if after all that, there's no mark on the front of the wall covering, um, it's passed the scrubbability test. And um, Oh, you can guess this must be really loads of fun for the technicians that do it. <laughs> you know, perhaps, uh, that's, that's, well, maybe that's just me. But anyhow, so those, we just run through what I think are the, the main performance requirements for a contract wall covering. Um, if we could go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Just a, a few other things. Um, our business has, has ISO 14001. That's a good thing for the point of view of maintaining your uh, ability to not affect your local environment. Um, but something that we had done a while ago is that we had our um, wall coverings put through a, a life cycle analysis. And I don't know if people know much about this, but it means taking your wall covering and examining uh, from cradle to grave what are the environmental impacts of the materials that you're using. Um, the manufacturing process that you use and the disposal technique. And it gives you a, a scientific way of being able to judge how much of an impact your products are making. Could we just click on, the, on this? Um... Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the BRE. Um, so, so Murispec had its um, life cycle analysis carried, carried out by BRE um, because we wanted the association with, a business, uh, with, a, with an accreditation scheme that was uh, well respected throughout the world. And um, this means that we've got a measure of the environmental impact of our products. The BRE system measures environmental impacts from zero to 100. And 100 is the maximum and that's based on the impact of one European citizen, citizen in a year. So you and I, if we live for a year, um, everything we do um, has an average impact on the environment of a, a hundred on this me method of measuring. Um, our wall coverings come out at about 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so the actual overall impact in the big scheme of things is, is, is very low. Um, we have, uh, our wall coverings can contribute to lead points. Um, earlier we had the BRE scheme mentioned, but there are a number around the world, when you do a fit, an office fit out or a hotel fit out, um, you, can, uh, you can show the world that you've done uh, an environmentally responsible fit out by uh, adopting a particular type of scheme. BRE um, is one of them. There's an American one which is called LEED. Um, and then there's, there's, there, are, there are others like Green Star in Australia. Uh, different regions may have their own different um, methods. 
But again, there are, because of the materials, the techniques, and the certifications that we have, we can contribute to those schemes um, to, because our, material, our products make a, a positive statement within those uh, environments. Our business is ISA 9001 registered. This, a lot of businesses are these days, but it's not to be taken lightly because it is a guarantee of, of good design, purchasing, and good control of manufacturing and, and inspection. Um, we have, we can supply for all of our materials something called a light reflectance value. And this is important in uh, schemes where you're considering people who are partially sighted. So when, if you're putting together uh, a, a scheme where you have a, a corridor and you need to show different areas which are difficult to perceive, you can change the light refle reflectance value of the materials in the corridor. So people who are partially sighted can know where they are or they can, they can it, it's actually a means of helping people who have poor distinction of objects to be able to recognize transitions as they go through a building. And this is something that architects and designers are pretty well switched on to. And in some places, there's, stat there's a statutory obligation to take that into account. Um, so it's very helpful from, for us to be able to provide you with light reflectance values. So if that's part of your scheme, you know what you're getting. Okay. We uh, move back, please. Okay. Could you click on the technical support, please? Thank you. Um, this is more, if you like, to ref reflect that um, as a business, when we when we get in, uh, when we form partnerships with people who are supplying our our wall coverings. We want to make sure that they are fully equipped to answer any of your queries or give you any supporting information that you need. So we'll supply all of our partners with a, a detailed database that gives them every product in our range. It gives uh, all of the certifications and the relative certificates. And so for our partners, Anyone who's on the f can answer a question like, "Can I have a can I have a uh, declaration of performance, please, under the uh, construction products regulations?" And if we just click on there, anyone in the office who has access to this database can just pull up the right certification. So what we're we're trying to do is we're trying to offer beautiful products with great technical performance and to make sure that that's not just in someone's head back at the factory, but that everyone in our partnerships have got access to that information. If we could... And on, oh, okay, so that's my job. <laughs> okay, right. Um, so part three here, I just wanted to get into some practical considerations. Just about how to make sure, that really simply, right product, right place, what type of adhesive to use, and, that, and just a couple of techniques for getting good joins. Now, this might not be of great interest to architects and designers, but it's, it is interesting to know that there are just a few little things that's very simple that make a big difference and take the, any kind of stress out of um, a wall covering installation. We mentioned earlier the different product types, the uh, fabric back wall coverings, the type ones, the type twos, and paperback vinyl. And firstly, to say, there are no golden rules. You can put whatever you want, wherever you want it. It's, there's, there's nothing that says you can't do that. As I said earlier, the, our commercial wall coverings will last a long time, but just as a bit of guidance, generally speaking, the Type 2 and the fabric back wall coverings are really good for high traffic areas like corridors, um, lift lobbies, reception areas, staircases, staff canteens, areas where you've got a lot of people movement. If you put a, if you put a retail product into these environments, 
you'll be redecorating before too long. If you put a type 2 product in these areas, you won't. You'll be having that product there for as long as you get bored with it. So, I mean, we, don't want, we want to encourage people to change their wall coverings, obviously, but it'll last a long, long time. Again, no golden rules, paperback product. Here, you're looking at areas where people, there isn't so much traffic of people. And here, where value for money is important, you might want to go for a paperback wall covering as opposed to a type two. But there's no doubt about it, it will last a long time. But there is one golden rule, and that is you have to make sure that you match your wall covering that you choose to your local fire regulations. It's a big mistake if you don't do that. Also, if you're supplying into marine environments, you actually don't have a choice. It's the law. There's a piece of regulation called um, the Marine Products Directive, which means that within, it means that European flagged ships must have IMO approval. There's no ifs or buts and maybes. Similarly, outside of the EU, the International Mar Maritime Organization has basically said the same thing. Anything that goes on a boat has got to be safe for being on a boat. So. It's a statutory requirement. There isn't any getting around it. So your wall coverings have to be IMO registered. And um, happy to say ours are. And it's not easy and it's not cheap to do. It's, uh, but it's worthwhile. We offer quite a range of adhesives to go with our wall coverings. And um, it's a reasonable question to say, why? Why don't we just go and get some packet adhesive from down at the local shop, mix it up and use that to put our wall coverings on the wall? And I'm mentioning this because when you purchase some commercial wall coverings from us or our partners, you will be asked, what type of adhesive do you need? It'll usually relate to what kind of product that you're buying. The reason this is important is that um, the world's walls are not all the same the world over. So you have different types of walls just depending on the way they've been constructed and decorated and what their history is. Some walls have been kicking around with layers and layers of paint for ages. And if you just go and if, if, if the people who are installing just ignore that, it's going to result in trouble. So. It's not difficult, but there's just that little bit of understanding needed that surfaces come in uh, different types like absorbent and non-absorbent. And choosing the adhesive is important in this because absorbent surfaces, they can suck water into the wall. So that means the adhesive, when it dries, it does its job, it forms a film, pulls the wall covering tight, job done. But if the surface is non-absorbent, if you use a, a water-based um, adhesive, the water's nowhere to go. So the product doesn't dry properly, you get bubbling, you get joints lifting, you, get, you can get all sorts of problems. And it's just a simple understanding of what type of wall you're dealing with. Understanding this means you can get results on loads of different surfaces. Really, you know, you can make your wall coverings work really well. So I won't dwell on all of these, but you can see there are lots of different absorbent, um, uncoated surfaces. Um, there are absorbent coated surfaces like um, that are, have been painted with a, a breathable paint. But then you get into non-absorbent surfaces like glass marble, laminates, fiberglass. And believe it or not, people do want to put wall coverings on these types of surfaces. You can get non-absorbent surfaces, ones that have been painted, for example, where it's been gloss paint has been used, which um, stops any moisture uh, movement between uh, the back of the wall covering and the wall. So there are a lot of different, the two different types of surfaces, lots of absorbent and non-absorbent, and lots of different types. But basically, 
That's why we have the different types. So for a paperback to vinyl, on an absorbent surface, we've got an adhesive called light. And that's light because paperback wall coverings, as you saw earlier, are, have the lowest weight. And therefore, you can use a, a medium duty adhesive. Um, if you have a non-absorbent surface, you can use a sealed surface adhesive, which is basically uh, an adhesive that works without needing the moisture to evaporate through the, through the wall. Um, for paperback wall coverings, we have an adhesive called standard. And then for non-absorbent surfaces, again, sealed surface. For acrylic back textiles, we have absorbent, where we start to use a, a product called heavy, which has got more polyvinyl. Uh, I'll, I'll actually go into that in a minute. And for fabric back vinyls, uh, like the type twos, for absorbent surfaces, again, heavy and non-absorbent sealed surface adhesive. So we have a system for each type of wall covering. It's not, it's not about overcomplicating the choice. It's about making sure that when you come to do the decoration work, you get a good result. Just to give you some insight as to what, what the difference is, um, it's all about the amount of PVA, polyvinyl acetate. I think most people might know that um, your normal adhesive, that, um, packet adhesive, will be based on starch, but our, our adhesives contain uh, polyvinyl acetate, PVA, which actually increases the adhesion. It actually really helps the product stick down very well. And you can just see from light standard to heavy, the amount of PVA increases. The other thing to mention is that our, our, all of our wall coverings include some fire retardant and uh, some preservative. And the fire retardant also helps us achieve the highest level of performance for uh, uh, fire performance for our wall coverings. So another reason why we, we supply these uh, adhesives is it helps your system achieve the performance that it needs for, for fire. I, just to mention, there is a, a product called uh, Easy Strip, which is if, it, it does seem more likely these days that buildings will just have, be left with plasterboard and will be a completely undecorated. And if you hang uh, a fabric back wall covering onto, pure, or just onto plasterboard, um, it will, at the end of its life, when you remove the wall covering from the wall, it'll rip the paper level of the plasterboard paper layer of the plasterboard off. Um, so we offer a, uh, an adhesive which at the end of the life will allow the, uh, the fabric material to be stripped cleanly. Uh, we supply a primer which for absorbent surfaces you also need to use as well. It helps equalize the surface to make sure um, that you can um, basically it helps the adhesion and it, 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 it promotes the um, ability for you to move the wall covering around when you're decorating. So just to summarize, the keys, keys to success for commercial wall coverings are choosing the right product, getting the surface preparation right, and using the right adhesive, and then just knowing, well, basically having a good decorator do your job. Um, but then there are a couple of tips that uh, for commercial wall coverings, uh, that are important, and well, they're called reverse hang and overlap and trim. And uh, I'll very quickly run through those for you. So, in your packs, when you looked at the paperback sample, you can see that it's pretty much even. It's a woven kind of effect that doesn't have any direction to it. When you've got a product like that, the way to get really invisible joins is that when you cut the product to hang it, you turn each drop 180 degrees to each other. So you can see like, like that. So as you take it off the roll, you lay the first bit out. And instead of just taking the second bit and laying it on top, you turn the roll so that the material is 180 degrees. And you just reverse each alternate drop. 
Now, if I had more time, like another couple of days, I'd be here still showing you. But, but basically, this is a very simple technique for contract wall coverings to make the joins invisible. It's different to what you would normally expect to do, which is when you've got a, a design which has to be matched, you obviously you can't do that because if you, the triangles would be the wrong way up, so the, the product wouldn't look correct. That's just a simple technique. And it, all of our materials will show you on, on, the, um, on the label what type of product it is, whether it's straight or reverse hang. And then one other technique is called overlap and trim. And this is where basically, instead of joining the wall covering together just by pulling the edges together, which is called butt joining, you actually overlap the product by about five centimeters. You put a plastic strip behind the join that you're trying to, to make, and then you just cut down the middle. And because you've cut both of the bits at the join in exactly the same place by doing this, when you remove the extra bit of waste that's created by doing that, and the, the pieces fit together, the edges fit together, they fit together perfectly. And it means that you get, in combination with the reverse hanging and overlap and trim, you'll get an absolutely perfect joint. Another little thing we supply is a joint cutter, which is actually a, a means of stopping um, cutting into the wall. If you use a knife and you're cutting a join, if you cut, in, cut into the wall, it will uh, cause joins to open. So um, this is just a, a helpful tool. So just to summarize, um, right product, right place, good surface preparation, right adhesive, good hanging techniques, and then just stand back and admire your handiwork. Um, you may not think I have a life for saying this, but contract wall coverings is absolutely amazing. I've been working with them for 38 years. I love the industry and I love the products. They're beautiful, they're resilient, um, and with just a few simple techniques, you can just completely transform your walls, and you can have the uh, you can have the knowledge that you're actually using a product that is safe as well as being great looking. Our products are manufactured in the UK. As I mentioned, and I keep banging on, this is important. We have give you a full range of technical support and a lot of certification to back up anything we say. And um, we're here, to, well, I'm here today as a guest of uh, Yanis Kalitranis and uh, his associates. Um, and um, I've been very privileged to speak to you today. So thank you very much. If there's any questions, happy to take them.